So depression, anxiety, a lot of people say this is a chemical imbalance and we can't retrain our emotions. How would you, for people that are kind of like listening to this, thinking about retraining their brain and suffering with that, what, what would you say? So what I will say is that everything I'm about to say is based on my understanding of the current status of the science. But I became really interested. I mean, I've always studied mood as a scientist, but I became much more interested um, in these questions of anxiety and depression. I mean, I've always kind of be interested in them, but my daughter, when she was an adolescent, became clinically depressed. And I do what I always do. I go to the literature and I try to figure out what's going on in a way to help her. And I should say the, you know, she's 25 now. And I've just started talking about this because she's, you know, she's old enough to give her consent. So I'm talking about this with, with her consent, but well, here's the thing that I realized your, your brain is its most important job is regulating and coordinating the systems of your body. And this understanding holds a key to understanding negative mood. So we don't walk around, um, ex we don't experience ourselves or the world as, as having anything to do with our metabolism or the state of our body or how well our organs are working or anything like that, right? We don't experience every hug we give, every, every um, insult we bear, you know, every emotion we experience. We don't, exp we don't experience this as having anything to do with glucose metabolism or how much salt we have or what's the pH of our blood or anything like that. But that is, turns out to be super important under the hood. And the technical term for the brain's predictive control of the body is allostasis, not homeostasis, but allostasis. But I like to use the metaphor of body budgeting. So your brain, and this is a metaphor, okay? All metaphors are wrong, but some metaphors are useful for sort of encapsulating something important. So that's what we're doing here. We're using, a, this is a, a really, I think, really powerful metaphor. I've heard at this point from tens of thousands of people, actually, that they find this a useful metaphor. Your brain is running a budget for your body. It's not budgeting money. It's budgeting glucose and salt and oxygen. And um, it's budgeting all of the chemicals and nutrients um, that um, are necessary to keep you alive and keep you well. And it's budgeting in a predictive way. And there, meaning it's anticipating the needs of the body and attempting to meet those needs before they arise, because that's the, actually the most metabolically efficient way, the energy efficient way to run any system is to anticipate the needs of the system and make sure the resources are there when the system, where the system needs them, when they need them. And if you think about it, it's also a good way to run your own like financial budget to spend money once it's in there, you know, as opposed to, right? Because if you borrow money, you pay interest, man. And that interest can add up really fast, which is also true of a body budget. I'm thinking of my P&L right now as you're talking about this. Exactly the same. In general, the way we generally think about mood is that your brain is always regulating your body. Your body is always sending signals back to your brain. To on the It's reporting on the metabolic state of the body, all the cells and the, this nutrient and that nutrient. And the brain makes itself aware not of all those little details, but it makes itself aware of the metabolic status of the body as mood. So when you're feeling pretty good, it means body budgeting is going pretty well. When you're feeling unpleasant, it probably means that you're running a deficit momentarily. Like when you're exercising, right? You feel fine and then you start to feel like shit. <laughs> and that it's because, you know, you're draining your probably lactic acid is building up and your, the pH of your blood is changing slightly. And, you know, you're, you're building up a deficit, which, which you replenish, right? You pay back what you spend by drinking water and, you know, having electrolytes and maybe eating something and, you know, so on and so forth. The thing is that 
Um, and when you're learning something new, it sometimes it feels unpleasant because it's hard and it actually it's more expensive to, to learn something new than to just go with your predictions. But we could talk about, you know, what are the metabolic savings? What are taxes? How does that work? But the more important point about depression is that depression is basically a bankrupt body budget. You can think about depression as a system that doesn't have the juice. It just doesn't have the metabolic resources to, um, to do all the things that a, a body and a brain would normally do. And so it tries to cut costs. And the way that it cuts costs um, is um, um, you start to feel fatigued. You start to not want to move very much. You, um, you might feel distressed. Um, basically, these are symptoms of a body budget in distress. And so, you know, your immune system, for example, if you have peripheral inflammation throughout your, if you have systemic inflammation throughout your body, that's, your immune system is super expensive metabolically. And there's this intimate relationship between energy regulation and your immune system. So if you are um, overspending, um, eventually your immune system can kick in for various reasons. There are various technical reasons why this is the case. It's also the case that if you have persistent inflammation um, that's elevated due to, I don't know, COVID. Diabetes. <laughs> Diabetes, heart disease any kind of um, autoimmune illness, right? That, um, that basically um, that will be like an extra tax that you're paying um, um, systematically and it will drain your body budget over time. So you're, there's no, instead of asking, how come people who have heart disease are more likely to become depressed in the sense that like, how does heart disease cause depression? You know, we would, what we how we approach things is say okay well there's a common set of causes here and that is that there's some there's some set of metabolic problems which are at the root of both of those sets of symptoms every illness physical illness every physical illness has mood related symptoms that go with it and every mood disorder which people think of as psychological has some physical basis usually in immune function or in metabolic function. And so this is, I think, um, you know, a key insight, right? So one thing to understand is that sometimes when you're feeling really distressed or really dragged out, it's not because something is wrong with the world. It's not because you're a bad person. It's probably, it could be that you are just running a budgeting. You're having a budgeting deficit and you just need a little self-care. Sometimes there are things that are wrong in the world that are draining your body budget. And sometimes there is something wrong with your body. There is a physical problem that is causing unnecessary expense. But sometimes, especially, you know, we live in a world that is full of uncertainty, which is incredibly expensive. And expensive some, on your brain, you mean, don't you? It's expensive, expensive on your brain. In, yes. Yeah, and energy. Exactly, exactly. And for anxiety is, is sort of, there's a similar story there, you know, just very quickly. You know, what does your brain attempt to do? when there's uncertainty, because uncertainty is expensive. It's expensive because you have to maintain, the brain has to maintain multiple predictions over long periods of time. That's just expensive. So it's really, you know, and so what you, the reason why your brain is predicting as it is, is to try to reduce uncertainty, to, to, um, to make uh, perception and experience and action manageable in a only partially predictable, but ever changing world. And, if your brain can't predict in advance what you will see and hear, you'll basically experience noise. You you won't have, it's called experiential blindness. You just will, I have examples of this and um, in, in talks that I give, you know, where I show people something and they can't see anything. It's just a bunch of blobs. And then I give, I 
teach them something um, that allows them to predict. And all of a sudden they see, now they see an object. <laughs> and it wasn't there before, but now it is. They're looking at exactly the same image, but now they see something they didn't see before because everything you see is partially in your head and partially in the world. Everything you see is partially the remembered past and partially the sensory present. If the sensory present stays the same, but you change the remembered past, now people can see something that they didn't see before. And so if your brain can't, if it can't reduce the uncertainty, it will attempt to take in that error, the signals that are it couldn't predict, which we call prediction error. And so it's doing something that we have a fancy name for in science. We call it learning. Your brain is learning. And when learning happens or when the brain is attempting to learn, there is a change in certain neurochemicals that can increase your heart rate, increase your speed, your breathing rate, um, that can basically make you feel jittery and activated. And if that persists over a long period of time, people experience that as anxiety. So oftentimes anxiety is uncertainty. You can, you can kind of dissolve the, uns, you know, the anxiety and you can, um, in, in its place, experience uncertainty. The physical sensations are the same, but you're giving the incoming sensory signals are the same, but you're giving a different meaning to them. And as a, with, by remembering differently, and as a consequence, your brain will plan and do things that are different, right? In anxiety, we withdraw. In uncertainty, we forage for information, right? Or another example I give in the book, and I often use, um, when my daughter was 12, um, she was testing for her black belt in karate. And, um, you know, her, her sensei was a 10th degree black belt, which in the United States is the highest you can be. So this guy was like, he could like break a board by looking at it. Okay. That's how strong he was. He was just like really strong. And she's this tiny little five foot, you know, girl basically. And she's, she's, she has to spar with all of these like hulking boys who are like a foot taller than her, much stronger than her. And this is what she's going to have to do for her black belt. And her sensei kind of saunters up to her, you know, and he just puts his hands on his hips and he looks at her and he says, get your butterflies flying in formation. And I thought, wow, that is a great concept. So in what he just did there, he didn't say calm down, little girl, because calmness is not what she needs. She actually needs that energy. What he did was he, he transformed the meaning of those sensations from anxiety into determination. And this is something the research shows that you can, anybody can learn to do this and that it has very profound effects on people's lives. It's not always easy to do, but it's doable. 